Thank you for joining us today. My name is Lech and I'm the product manager here at Canonical. I'm taking care of security, compliance, and Ubuntu Pro. Been with Canonical for more than three years now. And today with me, I have a pleasure to uh, let Alex introduce himself. Hi, yeah, so my name is Alex Morridge. Uh, I'm the director of security maintenance here at Canonical. Um, so I look after the engineering side and uh, responding to, to the risk in the products that we maintain. Um, and yeah, I've been with Canonical for about two years working alongside LEC. Yeah, we've been working quite closely together. So today we will share with you some of the ideas that we have for like broader open source security. And we'll tell you a bit more about how we deal with security specifically for, for Ubuntu. Before we jump into that, let me just give you a couple of um, housekeeping notes uh, for the for this webinar. So you can ask questions throughout this webinar goes. So there should be like a box where you can we can raise your questions and we'll pick some, hopefully all questions at the at the very end of this webinar. So we'll we'll answer to those. And the sooner you ask your question, the better chances they are that we we can we can get through that. So uh, so be be sure you you raise your questions. If you have questions already, you can start dropping them right now. The topic of today's webinar is the open source security best practices for early detection and, and the risk mitigation. So I, I think it's a, it's quite a broad topic, don't you think, Alex? Yeah, it, it covers, we can cover a lot of different uh, areas today. We probably won't go into all of the detail in all of them, but to, to touch on a few areas, uh, this covers the, the knowledge that you need to, to operate in an open source environment, uh, some of the tooling that, that will help you to, to operate safely. Uh, and some of the processes that you can implement to to make your lives easier uh, going forwards. Okay, yeah, I think that it's good to identify some of the key areas that we are uh, that we're gonna cover. So thanks for that. Uh, we can go through them one one by one, but maybe first we can start uh, just describing the open source security landscape in uh, like a broader picture, like taking a step back, because I think that there are some implications that open source has that you know closed source or or proprietary software will 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 not will not follow this is uh, related to the fact that you know open source have a very broad community and it's quite open so you can you can see what's actually going on right and i think that encourages everybody in the community to adopt kind of best practices about disclosing vulnerabilities and and not hiding anything and working in a uh, in a responsible way uh, that that kind of benefits everybody uh, because there's no there's nowhere to hide. Uh, everything is open, and and I think that really benefits the consumers of open source software. This is great. So I guess that the the conclusion from from that will be that, you know, the more a piece of software is being used, open source piece of software is being used, the more people will be interested, and the more people will will look into that. So the more popular the piece of software is, the, the more secure it, 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 it might be. Would it be the first statement or, or do you think that this is not always true? Uh, no, I think, yeah, I think uh, that that is true. And I guess also what you get with that is, you know, the more use of a product there is, not only does that imply it will be more secure and, and it'll get more attention in terms of identifying vulnerabilities, but you can also be, you can also rely on the stability of that more as well. If, you know, for any updates that are made, there is a huge kind of natural testing base there uh, that you can uh, benefit from and rely on. So uh, I guess on both sides of the coin, uh, it, you benefit from from the community and all of the other users of the software that you're consuming. So coming back to, to what you said at the very beginning about the knowledge, the tools and the, and the processes, could we touch on, on some of the, the aspects of that? So what's, what do you see as, as fundamental pieces of, I don't know, knowledge for, for open source specifically? And I guess you, you see a lot of, of, of knowledge and expertise in, in, in you, the security team that you're leading as well. There is a kind of uh, learning curve that's needed when getting up to speed with open source and, and webinars like this are part of that. Um, in, in terms of understanding the, the landscape that you're getting into and particularly the ongoing risks that are associated with using any piece of software, uh, but the risks associated with using open source will be slightly different. Uh, but that's not to say that there are greater risks. It's just a slightly different approach is needed. So that approach of kind of doing your homework, getting up to speed, uh, and, and through kind of training and, and experience and, and making use of all of the resources that are out there, I think is, is very important, uh, for anyone coming into this fresh, uh, would you like to add anything to that? No, I would say that you cannot. Uh, get everything at once. So I think that using a, a platform like Ubuntu can at least offset some of the work that you would have to do yourself because you can consume 
uh, open source securely through the repositories that, you know, you and your team are taking care of. So I would say that it's better to kind of focus on the areas that you cannot cover otherwise, but you, you shouldn't try to do everything yourself. So use the knowledge that, that comes from, from others and the work that others have done in the, you know, wider community and, uh, you know, on the platform such as Ubuntu, which is like a, a collection of, of different pieces of open source coming from, from pretty much everywhere. Um, I know that tools are also important, like, you know, Ubuntu also is a, is a tool, is a platform that, that allows you to consume open source, but there are other tools that are important for like vulnerability detection, the CICD pipeline and so on. Do you want to cover a little bit on that? Yeah. So I think you could kind of think of this as, as three stages of a single process. So the first is understanding the software that you're running. So using software composition analysis, uh, tooling to, to tell you what software you're running and, and therefore what, where your risk exposure is, I think is very important to understand basically your starting point. And then once you have that using vulnerability databases or, or vulnerability scanning tools to understand of those, uh, components that you're using, where the vulnerabilities lie. Uh, this is one of the big benefits of, of the open source community is that there is uh, much more rich data around the vulnerabilities that have been discovered and how you should respond to those. So yeah, referencing or, or making use of vulnerability databases and scanning tools can really help you to understand what your risk exposure is today. And then the final, uh, step of that process is responding to those. So having a strong, uh, continuous integration, continuous delivery. So having, having CICD tooling to allow you to quickly and smoothly and painlessly respond to those vulnerabilities that have been identified, um, allows you to, to reduce your risk or manage your risk, um, and improve your situation. So I see it as kind of three steps of the same chain of, of understanding what you have, understanding where the vulnerabilities are, and then, and making sure you can respond to those efficiently. Um, yeah, would you like to add anything? Now, I think on the tools, we'll cover more, uh, regarding things like dependencies and tracking dependencies later on in this, in this webinar, when we'll talk about, you know, uh, dependencies coming in the Ubuntu repositories, but also dependencies coming from elsewhere, wherever you pull your, your open source code from. So I think we can, we can touch on that a little bit more, but now I just wanted to quickly move to, uh, the third aspect of, of open source security, which was around processes. I, I know that your team has. Uh, developed and implemented a lot of processes around, you know, building Ubuntu itself, making it secure out of the box, but also there are some processes that our users can follow to make sure that, you know, their, their open source is being run securely, uh, such as looking at the, you know, at least looking at the, you know, CVs and USNs that, that your team is publishing, but I'd like to, to give us more comprehensive view on, on what you think are the right processes for our users to follow, to make sure that their open source is running securely. Yeah, I think the there can often be a, a tendency to try and solve problems using tooling uh, and forgetting that it's the the people operating those tools and, and people doing the process that that is really uh, maybe often more important and often neglected. So I think processing processes is is a really important part of the picture. And this comes down to to things like you know having a a documented policy on how to consume and track the open source that you're using uh, again to help you understand what your risk exposure is. Uh, establishing best practices for coding standards, uh, in terms of kind of, uh, how you write your own code and how you also utilize the open source that, that you're consuming. Um, and then processes around conducting regular pen tests, uh, regular training for your employees, uh, and, and kind of keeping up to date, making sure that your, uh, that your users and that your, uh, engineers are, are fully up to speed with the best practices and, and, uh, the, that, not, that knowledge isn't going stale. So establishing a really secure process around that, uh, can, can really help to, uh, address issues before they even occur. Um, and obviously proactive responses is, is, uh, is always more cost efficient than the panicking once an issue has occurred. So doing those regular training and, and, um, educational parts is, is a really important part of the picture as well. I was asked a few times already about Ubuntu security specifically, because a lot of people are trying to understand, you know, why is making the platform or the, the operating system secure is such an important part. So in my kind of simplified view of, of things, I, I always thought that, you know, Ubuntu or the operating system that you run in general is the heart of the, 
of your of your application stack. It's it's what connects the the hardware with the with the software. So it connects like the application that you're running, which is the that the goal of 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 of, of your workload is is to run some some kind of application on top with the the hardware that you that you that you put together. And I I was wondering what in your view is making a uh, an Ubuntu platform specifically a, a a a way to consume open source securely like broader open source applications. Right. I think you know you, you use the word stack there, and I think that's a very useful way of thinking about this. You know, if you think of like a stack of building blocks or something, the the operating system is the one that lives right at the bottom of that, just above the hardware layer. And if you don't have kind of a stable foundation there and a and a very secure base on which to build the rest of your stack, then uh, then any any work that you do and any efforts that you put in above that are going to be kind of fundamentally undermined by not starting from a secure base. So, you know, that's why uh, Ubuntu and, and the operating system and the kernel and so on are such a, a foundational part of this picture, because if that is insecure, then then you can't fix that from above and, and everything that you do on top of that will be kind of fundamentally compromised. So, yeah, it, it, it really is kind of the heart of the system or, or the, the foundation on which everything else is built. And could you tell us a bit more about the features that we implement in Ubuntu, like out of the box that will make it secure just when you install it without even configuring more things or some, some things that maybe you, you should configure when you, when you install a fresh Ubuntu, Ubuntu, uh, on your, on your machine. Right. So we put in a lot of effort and, and we have been doing for many years to make sure that Ubuntu is, is secure, uh, by default. So as you say, secure out of the box, um, so things like having default security policies that most users won't ever see and, and won't ever be aware of that they are running in the background. So this comes down to, uh, such as, uh, restricting access to root accounts and, and restricting system level access, uh, good password hygiene. Um, and really a lot of this is, is built on top of our app armor framework. So this is the, the technology that we use to, uh, provide out of the box, uh, hardening and access control and sandboxing for applications. Um, and so, yeah, the, the app armor is the, um, is the kind of layer that we put on top of, uh, the standard kind of Linux kernel support, um, that, that is our, that is something we're very proud of and something we put a lot of effort into developing that, that can make our users more secure. Um, and so that's, yeah, that, that is something that, that you won't ever necessarily see, but that you'll be getting the benefit from every time you, you use or boot up your Ubuntu machine. And I know that there is a ton of work that your team and, and other teams at Canonical are putting into making sure that the CVs or common vulnerabilities and exposures are being fixed on a timely basis. And there is a, you know, there is a lot of, 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 of software in Ubuntu and there is a lot of CVs that are, that are related to that. And your team provides a lot of, of fixes for, for that, uh, for those CVs and, you know, newly discovered CVs are coming up every day. I know you need to triage them. This is the process where you kind of give different CVs, you know, pri the right priority, and then you, 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 provide some, some fixes for them. And Canonical has been successfully doing that for the last, last 20 years now. So can you tell us a bit more about, about this process? please? Yeah. So. New releases of uh, Ubuntu, so yeah, new releases are, are brought out every six months, um, and those come in a couple, couple of different flavors. So we have uh, interim releases, which come out, uh, as I said, every six months, and then we will release a, an LTS uh, every two years. Um, so those are the kind of uh, more famous ones, which the majority of our users are using. The most recent of those was uh, 2204, came out in April last year. So, I mean, Lek, you're probably better qualified than I am to talk about exactly the differences between those different releases. Sure. So, uh, as Alex mentioned, LTSs are our most popular Ubuntu releases. In fact, more than 95% of our user base are using, are using Ubuntu LTS. And interim releases is kind of, you know, cutting edge, latest version of all the application stack. This is more used by, by developers that want to get access to the, to the newest and the, and the most, most up-to-date tool chains and, 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 and development languages to make sure that they can, they can run on the latest, uh, uh versions of the applications they're using. And quite a new addition to this family is, is what we call Ubuntu pro, which is not a different release. It's actually 
a layer of additional services on top of an Ubuntu LTS. So you can uh, attach a an Ubuntu Pro subscription on top of Ubuntu LTS, you know, 2204 or 2004 or 1804 or even 1604. And it will give you access to additional features and additional security and hardening uh, services that we that we provide uh, together with with Ubuntu Pro, and I can and mention uh, some of those those features later on. Uh, but Alex, for you specifically, I was wondering what kind of implications for the security team are coming from you know those differences. So interim releases they are coming up much more often, but they have much shorter lifespan. So we only do security maintenance for those for nine months, whereas for Ubuntu LTS, we do it for five years for the Ubuntu main repository, which is then extended to 10 years with 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 uh, what used to be called Ubuntu Advantage and now is called Ubuntu Pro. And another feature of Ubuntu Pro will be to look into the universe repository, which is 10 times bigger than the main. This is the new part that we that we created last year. And this will make coverage uh, or make security patching for for open source coming with Ubuntu, I, I believe, much much more difficult for for you and your team because of the breadth of open source that is coming from from this repository. So I would really like to understand kind of the implications for for the security team and honestly, how how do you manage to to do all of this work? I, I I've seen some of the comments in in the press and also in the you know different forums trying to to figure out okay, do they really mean what what they said? Because it's 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 quite a lot of, of packages to cover. Right. So I guess to address the first point, so the difference between our interim and our LTS releases, uh, in terms of the security coverage that we provide there, there isn't a difference. So we provide the same level of security maintenance for our interim releases and the LTS releases. The, the difference is just in the timescales that you can expect that for. So as you said, interim releases are already uh, maintained for nine months. Um, and then after that, we would expect our the users of those to migrate to a newer version. So but while you are using an interim release, uh, you get the same level of coverage. And and this is kind of something that is very, very important and very uh, held dear to us is that, you know, the level of coverage that we offer for our interim releases and our LTS releases has been stable and consistent for the last, well, uh, 15 years plus. Um, and, you know, that's something that really our users can rely on that we have been doing this for a long time and, and we will continue to to do this and expand that coverage. Um, so they can kind of rely on this going into the future. The first Ubuntu was released in 2004. The first Ubuntu LTS was released in 2006. So definitely we have some some experience in, in making sure that all the security patches are applied and maintained for a long time. And then in terms of kind of the, the, the breadth of the work that we do here, you know, the only reason that we are able to operate at this kind of scale is because the the support that we get from the open source community. So as we as we mentioned at the top uh you know op the open source world is is really a community and and the work that we do and the value that we can give to our users builds upon the work that's done by the the thousands and tens of thousands of open source uh maintainers that there are that exist in the upstream from us so without that support yeah we we definitely wouldn't be able to to offer ubuntu pro in the in the breadth and depth that we do but because we can build on top of that and and also give back to that community, you know, we work very closely with them. We're not just consumers, we give back to them as well. But because we can build on top of that, what that means is that we can operate at a scale that that would be inconceivable for somebody who wasn't building on top of open source. Um, and, and then our users and users of Ubuntu can really get the benefit of that without having to worry about all of the all of the details of the open source and not having to have relationships with all of that huge open source community, right? So we we simplify that. So our users just have to work, deal with with Ubuntu and with Canonical, and then we will handle all of the upstream relationships for you and, and massively simplify your life. So you get you get the benefit of only having one supplier, but also the benefit of being able to leverage that huge open source community. Cool. Uh, there are a couple of things that I know that are quite technical, so I would like definitely of value for our, for our user base. So I would like to touch on that and maybe you can explain a bit more what, what do we mean by that and what it really, what it really means. The first one would be around uh, backporting of, of security patches. I know that there is a huge value of our, of our users because it allows them to keep their uh, APIs very stable and not to be forced to move to the newer version of, of applications. Can you tell me a bit more about what the backporting is and how it works? 
Yeah, so there is kind of a, a fundamental challenge that we have for those of us who work in, in the security or the application security world. There's a fundamental challenge there of, of every update that we make and every change that we introduce has a potential to impact our, our users. So because this is one of the reasons why people are often reluctant to update their software because they don't know what other, what changes they're going to pick up and, and maybe those are changes that they don't necessarily want. Now, the way that Canonical approaches this and the way that Ubuntu solves this problem is that whenever we release an LTS, we fix the version of every package in there. Um, so you could expect the, the versions of, of any component that you're using that will stay the same for the five years or the 10 years with Pro that you can expect to use that, that, that package or that component for. And what we, what our promise is, is that we will just apply security fixes to that. So we will take the security fixes that come in newer versions of that software and we will backport them. This is the, the backporting that we mentioned, and we will backport those versions, those, sorry, we will backport those security fixes to the version that we originally fixed on. So what that commitment means is that our users can expect to only consume security updates so that they can stay secure and that they can manage their risk without having the challenge of constantly updating versions, changing functionality, changing APIs or interfaces or, or whatever. So the the value that we can give through Ubuntu is the best of both worlds where you can stay constantly up to date, constantly secure, whilst also not having to worry about, you know, is this package that I used yesterday going to behave the same way today? Because all of the only changes that you'll get are the security changes. And does it mean that we would maintain some of the applications, some of the secure open source software longer than the actual upstream community uh, maintains it. Yeah. So this is something that we routinely run into is that, uh, supporting things, particularly for 10 years is a very challenging thing to do. And something that a lot of open source maintainers and distributors don't want to do because, because it's a very difficult thing to do. So often in the upstream products will be supported for two, three, maybe five years. And so when we support those for 10 years, we will, we will support those beyond what the upstream can do. Um, and yeah. And again, you know, when we make a commitment that we will support something for 10 years, that's something, you know, that you can rely on because it's something we've been doing for a very long time and something we have a lot of experience in. So as I was saying earlier, we do build on top of the open source community, but we're often adding value that you wouldn't get just consuming directly from the upstream and and this extra lifetime is is one of the big important areas of that and i guess also what you do is not only to get security updates from like newer versions of the applications and backporting it to the previous versions, but also making sure that doing that you're not breaking anything else so doing like proper testing and and, and implementing all of the security changes so that you are sure that nothing else is, is being impacted by that Right. And I guess that, that comes in two different aspects. So one is we do obviously a lot of our own internal testing before we publish any fix or any, uh, update, um, because we want, you know, we're very strongly motivated to not introduce any regressions or break any functionality. The other aspect of that, that our users can rely on is because Ubuntu is a, a huge community. There are a lot of people consuming our packages. There are I don't know, like you probably know better than I do, the number of the number of downloads we would have. But for any individual consumer of Ubuntu, you you, you get for free the value of all of those other users testing your packages and using them. And that means that if we do, and, and it does happen, it is inevitable that we will occasionally introduce regressions and push those out. But when that happens, we know about it very quickly, and then we respond to that very quickly as well. So, you know, because there is this huge uh, user base for Ubuntu, each individual user gets the benefit of everyone else essentially giving them that testing coverage for free. Cool. Thanks, Alex. And the other more technical area that I wanted to cover with you would be around the time to fix a, a vulnerability. I read the studies the other day. I think it was solid type. I, I'm, I'm not sure. But it said that the average time to apply a fix, which was available, uh, so it was already available day, day zero or day one, the average time that it takes an enterprise, I think it was in the US, to apply this fix across their production estate is 98 days. So it takes 98 days on average for a for a for a company to to get a security fix that is available and actually implements it on their across their production estate. And I know that for our like internal KPIs, we we do like 
24 hours, I think, for critical vulnerabilities. How are we able to, to achieve that? Yeah, so Ubuntu is, is a very well-established uh, member of, of the open source community. And what that means is that we can uh, leverage that position to be part of a lot of uh, embargo or vulnerabilities that are embargoed before they are announced. So it's quite common practice, particularly for very high or, or critical severity issues for um, the information about that to be shared with a very small select uh, group of companies or, or uh, organizations before it's publicly announced. And what that means is that we can prepare our updates uh, before the, the, the information is made public and available to the whole world. So what that means is that when it is announced, um, and when the details are public and then when potentially uh, malicious users can start to try and exploit that, we already have our updates prepared and we can immediately publish those, you know, often within an hour uh, of, of the public announcement being made. So because of the kind of privileged position that we're in is to be able to, to use our um relationships with a lot of other organizations and companies, we can be part of these uh, coordinated disclosures that go on. Um, and that means that our users can benefit from that because we are not trying to catch up. We are already ahead of the game uh, when this happens. And that's why we're able to to commit or that's why we're able to consistently perform at the level that you mentioned of, of one day for critical vulnerabilities and two weeks for high vulnerabilities. Um, because a lot of the times, you know, we're, we're uh, doing pre-work um, and preparing before those are announced. Thanks, Alex. I guess we encourage our users to, to consume open source from Ubuntu repositories because of all the reasons you mentioned. So all the work that you and your team is doing. But there are many reasons why, uh, you know, an Ubuntu user or anyone in the open source space will, will consume, uh, you know, packages or, or software coming from, from other places, like from GitHub or from like internal repositories and, and, and so on. And from all the work I'm doing together with, with our, with our customers and, and, our, and our partners, I know that this creates a lot of issues because of the, the fragmentation because of like tracking of different versions and making sure that for each of them, there is a maintainer. So all of this creates quite a lot of, of, of issues in terms of even having a, a visibility in, in what the problem might be and whether there, there should be some, some security, uh, uh, fixes that, that should be applied to across your, your open source stack. So I was wondering what's, what do you think is the, is the best way for, for, for our users and, and our customers? to address those kind of, of issues. Would you suggest that we, you know, you should be using uh, software coming from Ubuntu repositories wherever possible. And if you cannot, because, you know, we don't have a particular version of the application you need, or if you don't have, if we don't offer particular software that you, that you're running, what, what should be, what should be the approach there? Yeah. So kind of what we've talked up until now is, is the the maintenance and the support that, that our users can expect for us kind of for free without having to worry about it or without having to think about it. But but we also fully understand that there is a lot of software that, that people need and consume, whether that's a different version or, or just a different package altogether that, that we don't currently support. And then, so in terms of the advice we would give for this, I guess this comes back to what we were discussing earlier of having strong processes and, and having strong tooling. So whenever you know whenever you introduce any new open source software you should have a process around understanding uh that you're using something that is high quality that is maintained that that you can rely on especially if you're going to push it into production and the life cycle that that has and and what your plan is or when that life cycle ends and so on and then also around tooling in terms of scanning your 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 products and your data and your repositories to understand, you know, what open source you are using, where it's all coming from, if there was an issue in it, how would you respond to that? Um, and then uh, the final piece, as we mentioned earlier, was with CICD. So there will be vulnerabilities in your codes. That's inevitable. That's a fact of life. And so you need to understand, you need to ha have thought through ahead of time what you will do when that happens. And ideally you want that process and that response to be as quick as possible. So being able to produce a new build of your software automatically as quick as possible 
you know, with as few pain points as possible is, is really important to being able to manage that. And all of that work that I've just described should and can be done ahead of time. So what you don't want to do is wait until there is a vulnerability, particularly a critical vulnerability, and then have to figure all that out and then have to worry about, well, how do I rebuild this piece of software or, oh, do I have that component in my software at all? Do I, do I even need to worry about this? The more work that you can do the, ahead of time, the, the easier it will be to, to maintain and support your own products going forwards. And from the conversations I had with, with, with our, with our users and, and our, our partners, I often find that whatever, you know, version of software they are using, uh, and if it's not provided by, by Ubuntu today, oftentimes it's, it's, it's much more, uh, useful for them to pivot a little bit and to get to the version that we have uh, provided in Ubuntu repositories, because then they can really benefit from all the work that you and your team is doing. So, you know, moving from version, you know, 5.7 to 5.8, if possible, knowing that it comes with the full, you know, Ubuntu Pro assurance of getting security patching for the 10 years of, of, of lifetime of, of Ubuntu LTS. Sometimes it's, it's, it's really a, a, a key differentiating factor. This LTS promise is really strong because it takes an overhead from your team of doing all the security maintenance for extended periods of time and possibly worrying about, you know, migrations to newer versions, whenever the, the, the version of software is, is being deprecated to really have this long-term stability, uh, uh, for, for your open source stack, uh, and related to that, I think that whenever you install something, uh, you're more very likely to, to pull dependencies of, of this project as well. So could you, could you tell us a bit more about that, uh, Alex, about, you know, that the challenges that are coming from, from, from having multiple versions and multiple dependencies across your stack. Yeah. So one of the fundamental aspects of modern software engineering is that whatever software you're using, it will have, it will have a large dependency tree. I think that's, uh, you know, that's a fundamental fact of life now. And what that means from a security and risk point of view is that any vulnerability in any of the dependencies of what you're using affect you as well. So, you know, if you're just picking up some package, there might not be any vulnerabilities in there, but if there's a vulnerability in one of its dependencies, even if you don't know about it, you're consuming that. And so managing these dependency trees is, is an increasingly difficult, but also increasingly important part of, of managing your ongoing application security risk, um, in the modern environment. So this is where. Uh, scanning tools and automation can become really valuable in terms of identifying those, uh, those dependencies and, and keeping track of them, because, you know, you might be picking up five packages, but you might have dependency trees that run into the hundreds or thousands that you can't possibly expect to maintain by hand. Um, and dependencies also come in a number of different forms. So you, you know, obviously build time dependencies and runtime dependencies, keeping track of all of those differently and making sure that they're up to date. Those might be two separate stages in your ci cd system and so you again you don't want to you don't want to miss any of those because if you know if that's cold code that you're ultimately running then it's it's uh exposure it's risk exposure that you ultimately have and so you know keeping track of all of those is is the first part of the problem but then responding to vulnerabilities in any of those dependencies is uh is, is obviously the other side of that um and that can be very challenging to do especially if you're consuming that from a number of different places, you know, if you're keeping track of dozens of different open source repositories. So this is where, yeah, automation is very, very important processes, uh, having automating as much as you can. And this is where we would, uh, we would recommend, you know, if you can consume from us, if you can migrate the version or the package that you're using to one that you can consume from Ubuntu, then we will take care of all of that for you. All of our, all of our packages that we maintain, we maintain the entire dependency trees from them all the way down. Um, and so, you know, we have a, essentially a closed ecosystem where we maintain everything within that and everything that we build is based on other things that we build. Um, and so we have a really strong position where if there is a vulnerability in a dependency, we know that we can respond to that. So yeah, it, there is a very complicated problem that you have to solve and tooling can help you there. The alternative is that, you know, you can ask us to do that for you and, and, and we'll help you with that problem. It's amazing. Thank you, Alex. And I found the data point that I was looking for. So 20, 
2022 State of Open Source Security Report uh, by SNCC said that the average number of dependencies per project, uh, open source project, is 69. So 69 dependencies on average whenever you expose something. So quite a, quite a large number if you wanted to take care of all of that by yourself. Um, I guess that this is what we what we wanted to cover today. So before I uh, we jump to questions and and answer some of the questions that that you you raised. Uh, let me just mention that the session today has has been recorded, so you can receive an email with the recording, and you can share it with with your with your colleagues and so that with your teams. And if you'd like to, you know, drill down into some of the things that we covered, we we covered quite a lot of of substance today. So you can also so watch in on your you know uh, at at the time you 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 need, and we can uh, uh, definitely follow up with with some some webinars that will cover aspects of, of stuff that we talked about today in more detail in the future. Uh, and hopefully some of the questions that you raised will give us a good hint on what the next webinars could, could be about. Uh, so yeah, let's jump to questions. All right. So Alex had to run, unfortunately, but thankfully Emilia Torino from his team was, was here on standby, so she can help me out with some of the questions you guys asked you guys asked so thank you very much for for raising some of the questions and the first one i see on this on this list Emilia, you definitely can can help me answer answer that would be sure. regarding the ubuntu security versus debian security i think that folks would like to know how ubuntu security rate relates to debian which one is better and who's responsible for for fixing a a vulnerability that is a debian vulnerability and the package that affects ubuntu yeah, sure. So as people probably know, Ubuntu deviates from Debian, right? So we take benefit of all the work that Debian also does in terms of many things and also in terms of uh, security fixes. So whenever there is a vulnerability that, that affects a package that is packed in Ubuntu, first of all, we really make sure a patch is already available for that vulnerability because we have thousands of applications that run on Ubuntu, so we trust upstream and we trust the community. And we say, when we say upstream, we usually say Debian as well, because they already worked on the backports, they already tested. So we, we should take benefit of that as well. So yeah, we do interact with Debian and we take from there the patches when they have it available for the vulnerabilities that also apply to Ubuntu. Okay. In that case, I have a follow-up question, which is kind of related to that, which is about security vulnerabilities that have no fix available upstream. Mm -hmm. So what do we do when there is no fix available upstream? What do we, what can we, what can we do? Right. So um, we usually don't create our own fixes and our own patches. We have done it in the past for critical vulnerabilities, for, for things that really require uh, a remediation from our side. But usually we don't do it ourselves and the main reason is making sure we keep this commitment of the strong let's say ecosystem of applications that work together in ubuntu if if we need to fix a vulnerability of a package that runs on ubuntu but it's open source think for a moment about how many open source software we maintain there are thousands of applications out there so introducing a change that can fix a vulnerability could also mean we are introducing a regression and we can break the systems. So we have this kind of trust of chain to the upstream project, and we prefer to take the fixes from Debian from the upstream project rather than creating the bad ourselves. But it's also related not only to the variety of software, but also think about how the, the software is packaged. Like you can speak about packages that are written in Python, in Golan, in C, in C++. So the variety of applications in the programming languages and the internals of each of those applications that we maintain is so broad that we really make use of the community, the open source projects or Debian, as, as Alex explained also at the beginning of, of the presentation. Cool. Thanks, Emilia. I see two other questions that are more related to Ubuntu Pro, so maybe I can try to answer those. Sure. The first one is regarding the uh, tutorials or the documentation for hardening and applying hardening and, and tuning for, for Ubuntu servers, specifically here asked for, for the 2204. Um, so 
hardening and, and certification and, and, and compliance is part of the Ubuntu Pro value proposition. So if you sign up for Ubuntu Pro and you can get a subscription for that, you will have access to the ESM repositories. So all the security patches that we do above the, the standard security updates uh, for, for the main repository. And you can also get access to CIS hardening for server and workstation level one and level two. This is to apply the hardening, but also to audit the hardening. Unfortunately, the uh, 2204 doesn't have all the hardening uh, just yet. We are currently working on that, so this should be done, done very soon. But if you look at the previous Ubuntu releases, like 2004, the, hard the CIS hardening and disastic hardening is already available there. So you can go through the profiles, apply this, uh, this hardening rules, and get the audit. And 2204 should be, should be hardened very soon. Similarly, uh, the, the FIP certification is still pending, but should be, should be done very soon for, for 2204. But again, 2004 and also previous Ubuntu LTS releases can get all of all of that, and it's already available for that. Um, another question was regarding the, I guess, security for for desktop or in general. Does what we said for Ubuntu Server also applies for the desktop? And I don't know, Emilia, if you agree, but the desktop is is, is really the same Ubuntu. It's just Ubuntu Server with with graphic user interface in front of it. So everything that we mentioned for for Ubuntu. Uh, server also applies to Ubuntu Desktop, right? Yeah, indeed. And uh, in case people are curious about it, we have a public wiki, which is wiki.ubuntu.com, and there is a security features section where you can see for every Ubuntu release the different security features, and you can even see there some kind of variants depending on if it is server or desktop. So it's it's public, it's available for everybody. And Ubuntu Pro itself is also available for desktop and for server. And of course, Ubuntu Pro is uh, available free of charge for most of the users, like free personal users and small scale, small, small scale commercial use. Sorry for that. But also the uh, the, the the enterprise uh, uh, subscriptions are available for both desktop and server. And desktop has has you know more advantageous pricing than than server. So if you look at Using if you're if you're looking for using Ubuntu Pro on, on large scale for your enterprise use cases, have a look at the pricing page. There will be a different price for desktops and different price for servers. This is based on the use case. It's not based on whether you install Ubuntu with graphic user interface on, on top of it. It's actually based on the use case. So if there is like a you know a human sitting in front of the screen, we consider it to be the desktop. If you install you know Ubuntu uh, desktop in your data center, it's it's counted as server. So it's based on the use case, not on what, what which packages you actually install on, on, on your machine. Um, we had some other questions, Emilia, so maybe you can help me with, with those ones. There is one about the, the penetration testing documentation, so pen tests. What would you recommend? Yeah, sure. So at, at Canonical or in Ubuntu in general, we, we don't have kind of a public resource uh, to share. Uh, regarding best practices, I I usually think that uh, there could be general practices that, that you can find very good resources, like in the OWASP project, for example, the Open Web Application Security Project. There are a lot of recommendations in terms of not only pen testing, but also security vulnerability scanners in terms of infrastructure and also applications and also code. Um, so I, I recommend that people can take a look at those uh, to get a, a, a better understanding of, of general practices. We do have our public, the Ubuntu Security Wiki, as I mentioned before, and we also have as well our um, security main page in the, in the main website. And for example, we do execute some processes in terms of applications, not pen testing, but applications as part of uh, what we call the MIR, the main inclusion review process. So the applications that are included in main, we take care of making sure we do strong analysis to then be able to commit to maintain it as we do it for many different areas, including security. So there you can find some of the tools we run over the code to do kind of some static analysis, which is not pen testing, I know, but I'm, I'm talking more kind of general documentation that you can find available in uh, our website. But I also, again, recommend uh, sources like OWASP that contain a, a lot of very useful uh, information and it's it's updated frequently. Cool. Thanks, Emilia. Um, another question, I guess, also for you was regarding snaps. So we talked a lot yeah. about Debs and Debian packages. 
and how we make sure that they are secure and what are the security practices around that. But we haven't really covered SNAP, so someone's interested in what what, what do your team and open, you know what the security team is doing around around SNAP security. Yeah, sure. We also contribute in the SNAP's ecosystem. So um, if, in case people do not know, but uh, basically SNAPs are, are confined. They, they, they are kind of a standalone application, so they don't depend on the underlying system. And there are several technologies that are used to make it happen. So it's basically in SquashFS, read-only file system, and it uses technologies like Aparmor, as was described before, to make sure that Sandbox uh, makes that confining Kind of confinement um, happen. So still, there are like different levels of confinement, and I invite you to take a look at the documentation. There is an extensive documentation in terms of the security policy and unboxing the different levels of confinement, and 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 also we, the security team, interact uh, in cases where snaps that they have the a default, let's say, confinement. Sometimes they require extra accesses that by default are, are not provided. For example, let's say we are snapping the application that it's allowing to communicate today. So by default, if they, this application is snapped, it won't have access to the camera, to the, micro, to the microphone, because those mean accesses that the user need to be aware of if, if it is being used um, with the wrong intents of, or if it is compromised somehow, then you as a user are also compromised. In the case that it's needed, those accesses are needed. We have a voting process. You can take a look at the forum, the Snapcraft forum, where you can publicly see how we discuss about the accesses that the Snaps uh, needs to be given. And, and anyone can jump to the discussion or anyone can even see the accesses that it's being granted to, to the applications. Cool. Thanks for that. I see some follow-up questions to the topic that I just covered, so CIS hardening. Yes, we are doing level one and level two for both desktop and uh, workstation or, or, or servers. So this is available together with Ubuntu Pro subscription. Not yet for 2204, but as I mentioned, 2004 and before, you can you can get access to, to the scripts that allow you to apply the, the hardening uh, rules and also to audit that all of these rules have been applied. And this is certified uh, scripts, certified tooling that allows you to, to do that. And I also see another question related to Ubuntu Pro. So uh, what are the main differences between Ubuntu Pro and Ubuntu LTS? Um, they're all listed on our website. So if you go to ubuntu.com slash pro, you can see that very comprehensively put together in the, in the, in the, in the table. But if I can highlight uh, a few important ones, this will be the, uh, the scope of CV patching. So uh, Ubuntu LTS gets a security patching for the Ubuntu main repository, which is around 2,300 packages, while, uh, while Ubuntu uh, Pro gets security patching for a much broader scope, around 10 times broader. So we also include the universe repository in that. So this will give you in total around 25,000, more than 25,000 Debian packages covered uh, with, with Ubuntu Pro subscription. And also it extends the, uh, the lifetime of, of Ubuntu release. Ubuntu LTS is five years of standard support. But with Ubuntu Pro, you can get up, you can get the full ten years. So this will double the lifetime of of, of your Ubuntu subscription, and, and I'm sorry, Ubuntu Ubuntu release. And on top of that, you will have other uh, features, so certification and and compliance. We mentioned CIS hardening. We mentioned this is thick, We mentioned we mentioned uh, FIPS. So all of these are available with Ubuntu Pro subscription as well as access to landscape to manage your, your Ubuntu estate at, at scale, uh, live patch, kernel live patch to apply your security patches for kernel without rebooting your machines, and many more and many more features that you that you might find interesting. So definitely, if you're interested in Ubuntu Pro, go to the website ubuntu.com slash, uh, slash pro. You can get a free subscription on up to five machines and, and, and try it out today. And there are tutorials and, and other resources available for you to, to, to give it a try. Um, let me now uh, move to, to the next question, uh, and I guess this one is, is for you, Emilia, which is about, uh, I guess, your, your internal processes. So uh, the question was around the, uh, you know, us making sure that every CV that is discovered is actually analyzed by the, by the security team. How do you, how do you make sure that, that this happens? Yeah, that's an, an interesting question. So as, as you can imagine, there are like, I guess as of last year, almost 100 CVs created publicly out there. 
So we really need to make sure that we analyze each, of, each one of those and understand if, if it affects Ubuntu or not. Like not every CVE affects Ubuntu, of course, but if it does affect, we need to make sure we are kind of triaging it. That's the name we use internally. So we are a team. We are like less than 30 person, but we have kind of some responsibilities in a rotation scheme, but every single day, there is someone in the team that is responsible for triaging CVs. We have a set of automated tools that help us fetch all the CVs from Mitre, from MBT, and also map the potential affected software to the Ubuntu software. But at the end, there is, also, there is always someone like taking a look at it because sometimes the CV descriptions are not that helpful to understand properly the software and the versions that are available. And if if you understand like how the so many Ubuntu releases we maintain because of all the LTSs and all the interim releases plus the ESM ones, we have a lot of different versions of every single project that we maintain. So sometimes a given CVE can affect, I don't know, six, seven Ubuntu distributions. So we also need to map a specific the specific version in the specific Ubuntu release uh, we are maintaining to the vulnerable, the vulnerabilities that it's that it's being created and it also sometimes sometimes means getting into the code again i i see the work we do in the security team as a very interesting software engineering talent as well because we get into the code to understand python code c code c plus plus code infrastructure details like understanding the vulnerability it's it's a combination of many different things that need to happen to, to properly patch it in ubuntu yeah, on all the different releases and flavors Cool. Thanks, Emilia. I think that the very last question is probably for me, which is around the support that you can get together with Ubuntu Pro. So Ubuntu Pro itself comes without support. It's bits only. So it's it's, it's an offer that allows you to get more uh, features on top of your Ubuntu LTS, but it doesn't automatically come with support from, from Canonical. And support from Canonical means that you can reach out to our, our engineering teams and they can help you out with your with your setup or with bug fixing of any particular issue that you find in in in, in the code, and what would the uh, difference uh, in our in our products that we that we sell commercially to our to our enterprise uh, customers is between different scopes of support that you can get. So there are there is there are two important differenti differentiators. One is regarding the um, the level of, of of support. So there is infra only support which is our support for your operating system itself. So what you can find, the, all the packages that you find in Ubuntu main repository and the infrastructure components. And this will be your OpenStack, your MAS, your uh, LexD, your Kubernetes, whatever. So we will support you across all of that. Or you can opt in for the full stack support. And this will also include all the uh, applications, tool chains and, and languages and different packages that you find in the universe repository as well. So again, there is this uh, variety of, of, of choices that you have. You can opt in for something that is much smaller scope and is cheaper, or you can opt in for like full stack support that will take care of your infrastructure bits, like, uh, you know, mentioned OpenStack. I, you can also add like Ceph storage, uh, the kernel, the operating system, so the base Ubuntu image, and then applications running on top of Ubuntu like Postgres or, 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 or Kafka. So this will give you the, the, the this, uh, support scope for the, for, the, for the full stack of your, uh, of your open source. And then the, another important differentiator is the, you know, the time frame and the SLA around, around uh, our response time. So you can get either the weekday support or 24 seven support and both of the subscriptions are available. If you go to our pricing, our pricing is public. So you can see what is the per machine price uh, for each of those uh, of those options and if you're if you're interested in that you can you can buy it directly through through our store or you can reach out to us and and contact our sales they're able to to give you more more context on that um and with that i would love to thank you all for for joining us today thank you for asking all your questions thank you amelia for for jumping last last moment and and being on standby helping me to to address some of the more more difficult questions here We'd love to see you soon, so so please join our our upcoming webinars and uh, yeah, have a lovely day. See you around. Bye bye. Bye.